Did God create the heavens and the earth? Which God created that? Our God. All right. Let's take that thought for a moment and think in terms of him having created the heavens and the earth. What makes him God? We usually say three things. Omniscience means he knows everything. Omnipotence, meaning he's all-powerful. And the one that's the hardest for me to say, omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere. I want you to stop and think about it for a moment. He's everywhere. He's right here this morning, isn't he? In fact, he promises that when two or more are gathered in my name, I will be there. But let's think about this God for a minute, all present. God is here this morning. Is he outside that door? You better say yes. The reason I say that is because we have kind of carried over culturally without really always being aware of it, the cultural concept of the Old Testament temple and this being a temple. Well, no, this building is not the temple. There's the temple. We are the building stones of the temple. God is here, but he's also out there. Is he on the other side of town? Yes. Is he on the moon? Yes. It's called omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere. When is he everywhere? All the time. How about Jupiter? How about Pluto? Not a planet. He says we can't use Pluto. It's not a planet. Ah, my childhood is ruined. The nearest star is uh, approximately 2.3 million, no, 2.3 light years away, named Alpha Centauri. And it's a multiple star, isn't it? At least two, maybe three. Binary. Binary, okay. Where's God? He's there. If we get to Alpha Centauri someday, one of those stars may have a place on it. We could park a vehicle for a few days. Is God there? Yes. The nearest galaxy to our Milky Way galaxy, in fact, it's almost a sister galaxy, but it's a spiral galaxy like Milky Way. It's called Andromeda. You see it from the southern skies. You don't see it from our, our part of the world. And I didn't even look up how far away that is. Two million light years. See, I didn't need to study for this lesson. I got it right here. Two million light years away. That's a long ways away. Is God there? He is? He made it. He made it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. The heavens and the earth. Hubble telescope was put up in orbit, uh, and that's been a long time ago now. Took some pictures, fabulous. Found out it was nearsighted. They had to fix the lens on it. They got that fixed, and it even got better. Then they picked a dark spot in the sky. I don't know where it is. A black spot, no stars in it. You know what I'm talking about? And then every night for 15 nights or however long it was, they would focus on that spot and leave the camera open and keep it following it and then shut it off. And then the next night they'd do it again. And they did that for a couple of weeks. Then they took those images and shuffled them together. It says, is there anything there? You guys have seen the deep field uh, Hubble picture, haven't you? Star, well, actually it's not stars, those are galaxies. And it's a f picture frame that's filled with all of these dots of light. Our God created that. Is that our God? Not some other God? That's our God. He created that, and he's there at the same time he's here. How big is your God? A man came into a courtyard, and there was a Muslim man and a Buddhist man sitting together talking religion. And by the way, you can tell this is a preacher story already, can't you? You know what a preacher story is? It's original with the preacher who's telling it because he forgot who he stole it from. Just want to make sure that's clear. It's probably true, but I don't know. 
The Muslim man was explaining to the Buddhist man what his religion was all about. Then the Buddhist man explained to the Muslim man what his religion was all about. The Christian man asked if he could sit and, and listen and be a part of this. They said, sure. When they got through, they asked him, what do you think? He says, well, it sounds to me like as a Muslim, you're trying to climb a mountain to get to your God, and you're trying to find him through a path through Islam. And the Buddhist man, you're looking for a path up the mountain to visit, to see your God, and you're finding it's, it's a different path, but it's going up that same mountain. They said, that's exactly right. Boy, you understand fully. He says, what if God came down the mountain for us, though? Boy, that would be great. He began to talk to him about Jesus. What do you think? You think that describes it? God came down the mountain to us. See, the reason I started with God being everywhere is because we have to get a sense of who it is that's coming down the mountain. I believe we need to understand who it is that's coming down that mountain for us. When Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Who's he talking about when he says, Seek the kingdom of God? He's talking about that God who is on Alpha Centauri, Andromeda, the moon, New York City, California, Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah, even there. He's here too. But he is the one who came down for us. We're not climbing a mountain to him. He came for us. How many of you in here, by anything that you can do, can make your day last one minute longer than it's going to last? Anybody in here has that power? I see a couple of bald heads. Uh, any of you in here have the power to grow a hair on a bald head? How about turning hair black that's white? Do you have that power, Ron? No? Speaking of uh, hair, my beard was turning white a number of years ago. My lady at church in Vistas came up to me with some just for men. And uh, I said, Phyllis, you got to remember, I graduated from high school with her second son. And Phyllis, uh, it doesn't bother me that my uh, beard's turning white. She says, well, it bothers me. <laughs> Can we, do we have it within our power to make these things happen? No, but God does. And if he has that kind of power, then why doesn't he keep us from going bald? Keep us from sagging? Keeping us from getting old? Keeping us from hurting? keeping us from turning white, because that's not his plan. His plan is for us to trust in him. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says, if God is concerned so much that he knows the numbers of hairs on your head, if he's so concerned that the lilies of the field are so beautifully dressed that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these, if he is so concerned knowing how many sparrows there are and concerned for that one sparrow and its needs. And by the way, sparrows are worthless, aren't they? <coughs> they're worthless. There's so many of them. And they're such a pest. But God cares for them. He says, how much more important are you than they? How much more important are you than the sparrows or the flowers or the grass? that God takes care of anyway, and yet you worry about whether you're gonna be fed, like we should worry about that, or clothed, or how we're gonna be taken care of. If God takes care of them, won't he much more so take care of you? When God created the heavens and the earth, we're told that uh, the uh, lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Do you know what that means? That means God knew we were going to sin. God knew you were going to sin. Well, why did he make you then? We keep coming back to that one word, love. It's not enough to really describe it for us because our understanding of love is rather limited. It's rather finite. God's love, just like his knowledge, 
just like his presence, just like his being is infinite. And so is his love. But he knew he was going to have to sacrifice his son before he created what he was going to have to be sacrificed for. Heaven came down. God created you out of his love that didn't even, his love existed, but we didn't even exist at that point in time. And yet he did it anyway. Creates this beautiful earth, beautiful little garden. Puts Adam and Eve in there. He says they're beautiful too. By the way, what would their beauty be like? Would it be like what's on the Vogue cover or some other magazine cover today? Probably not. God's idea of beauty might have been a little different than ours, particularly of uh, fashion. Uh, Fifth Avenue, I guess it is, in, uh, in Manhattan. But that was beautiful. There's this one tree. He says, don't eat of that. You won't like that. He says, not only that, but I, I have to kill you if you eat that one. Somebody says, well, that doesn't seem reasonable. That doesn't make sense at all that God, who would go through all this trouble to create this universe, to create this world, to create this garden, to create this people, then tells them that if they disobey him by eating of that one tree, that he has to kill them. How many, how many of you would think that's reasonable? Tell your kid. Uh, you do that. Well, it's, by the way, I tell my kids that all the time. You do that, I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> of course, the next time I say it, they said, yeah, right. But God meant it, didn't he? God meant it. An individual was talking to a, ta a taxi driver, uh, a Muslim, New York City. Kind of a cliche now, I know, but an, uh, an Arab guy. And uh, they were talking about uh, heaven and hell. And the Arab guy says, well, I'm going to heaven. Oh, you are. You haven't done that much wrong, huh? You not, you've not sinned. That's what the, was that guy, the passenger asked him. He says, oh, yeah, I've sinned. I just haven't sinned that badly. Okay, so what's going to happen? He says, well, I'll be punished for a while, but then I'll be set free and go to heaven, be with Allah forever. Hmm. Okay, so the guy asked him, he says, what would you do if I slapped your face? He says, I'd kick you out of my taxi right now. Okay. Seem reasonable? Wouldn't you do that? I mean, we'd all do that, wouldn't we? Um, what if I slapped that uh, woman over there on the sidewalk? She might call the cops on you, but if she doesn't, she might call some friends over to beat you up. Okay. How about if I slapped the policeman? He probably would arrest you. He might still beat you up, but he'd arrest you. What if I slapped the President of the United States? You see, it's the same slap, isn't it? What's the difference? The person that you disrespect, the person that you dishonor. When God told Adam and Eve, there's that one tree you don't eat of, it wasn't Adam and Eve disrespecting each other, although that's surely a part of it. That's not the point. Who was it they were disrespecting? Who were they dishonoring? God. Okay, but who's God? The God of the universe. The God in charge of it all. Is sin such a big deal? No, it's not a big deal at all, is it? I mean, after all, God's already given us an, a, a payment for it. A way of redeeming us. He did that in his mind before the foundation of the world. So what's the big deal about sin? God is God. He deserves honor, all honor. He deserves praise, all praise. He deserves respect, all respect. He deserves obedience, all obedience. And when you don't, you have just disrespected, dishonored the God of the universe. You haven't disrespected Haskell, Bill, no, no big deal there, right? But you disrespected God. So when you say, well, I haven't done anything that bad, I might have to 
suffer a little bit, maybe a little while, a little, little time of punishment, but then God will say, come home with me. You've suffered enough. No, that's not what it's about, is it? And in spite of that, God came down. Heaven came down. When you looked at the Garden of Eden, did you think that's what was going to happen? Well, I grew up in Sunday school, so of course I knew that, right? I was taught that time when I was little. Okay. But if you read it straight through from Genesis 1 on, you finally get to about chapter 6. And what does it say there? Chapter 5 and 6 and 7. We have the story of the flood. It says their thoughts of their heart were evil continually. Now, I can honestly say I do not feel that I'm that bad. Anybody want to? Agree with me on that for yourself? I don't think I'm that bad. And especially as a Christian now, I know I'm not that bad. But think about it for a minute. This is what God did. He created this earth, put man on it, gave him this wonderful garden. They sinned against it. He kicked him out of the garden. Here they are on earth now, and it says they thought evil continually. That doesn't seem like that's what God deserves, does it? So he says to destroy the earth by water. He finds a righteous man. He says, if you do this, I'll save you and your family. And he does. Noah and his family were saved. They built the ark, saved some animals. His family was saved. And from that family of righteous, all of us come today. It wasn't very long until there was a a plain of Shinar in which they started building a, a tower. They said, you know, if we build a tower high enough, we can see the face of God. Our astronauts went up there in a rocket ship and saw the face of God. Russian, uh, Soviet uh, ast- uh, cosmonauts went up there in a rocket and says, I didn't see the face of God, but ours did. Again, matter of faith perhaps, but he's there. Nevertheless, here's this plane. He says, we're going to build this tower and we're going to see the face of God. When they got there, first of all, God says, no, I don't think I'm going to let you do that. He confounds their language. They go off. We call it Tower of Babel. Babel meaning, of course, confused language. And we have a story about God's interaction with man. Well, isn't that enough then? God finally has set man straight. No. No, God hasn't set man straight yet. Why? Because it's not God. That's the problem. It's man that's the problem, isn't it? Finally, we have the children of Israel. Abraham being chosen out of an idolatrous people. And he says, come down here and I want to make you people out of you that will worship me and and respect me and honor me the way I deserve to be respected and honored. And through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He does so. And finally, Moses is chosen by God to lead the people out of captivity. Gives them the law on Mount Sinai. Said, if you follow my laws... You will be my people and I will be your God. And the seed promise went through them. Finally, Jesus was born. God came down. Jesus was born. An angel comes to uh, Mary, says, you're going to have a child, but I'm a virgin. Don't worry about that. The Holy Spirit will take care of that. You will have a child, but he won't be an earthly child. He will be a heavenly child. say, Haskell, you're paraphrasing. Yes, I am. But that's what it was. A vision comes to Joseph, says, don't put her away. She's pregnant, yes, but she hasn't committed adultery. You will instead recognize the scripture in Isaiah, which says that a virgin will be with child. His name will be called, he will be the savior of his people. His name will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means what? God with us. Did God come down? God came down, didn't he? Why in the world would a God who has a presence on Alpha Centauri, Andromeda, on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy, all the way across the universe to the other side of the galaxy, the universe, which may be 13.7 billion light years across, according to their measurements right now. They keep adjusting that, but that's, that's a long ways. Why would the God who is all the way over there and here care about us enough to come down to the earth for us? We go back to that question, love. 
It's agape love. It's not uh, eros. It's not phileo. It's agape. It's a u unique type of love that says, basically, in spite of, I love you. It's kind of like a parent loving a child when he's a teenager. I keep using that. Teenagers are not here this morning. I can say it. It's that love that says, I love you anyway. And in fact, it's a love that started before we were acting out against him. And he knew before that happened, I'm going to love you anyway. As parents, don't we understand that kind of love? I don't think that anything we do as a human being is going to impress God, nor is it really going to impress us that much, because after all, we've got something else we need to do next, don't we? By the way, how long has man been flying? 19 what? 1910? Early 1900s? God's been flying a long time, hasn't he? When he made the birds, how long have they been flying? Since they, were, since they started flying, huh? Yeah. God made you. You're not flying, but you understand the principle, right? But God gave you something even better than flying. He gave you a spirituality. A spirituality that allows you to make a choice to serve God or to serve man, to serve self or to serve God, to serve the spirit or to serve the flesh. Romans chapter 6, starting about verse 16, says, Know you not that whom you present yourselves as servants to obey, his servants you are whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But thanks be unto God that whereas you were servants of sin, you became obedient to that form of teaching that was delivered to you, and you became free from sin. Having put aside sin then, we became servants of righteousness. Do we deserve to die because we have obeyed what God gave us? No. Do we deserve salvation because we've done what God gave us? No. That's not the point, is it? The point isn't whether we deserve it. The point is God is good. I don't deserve salvation because I'm good. I deserve salvation strictly because God said he was going to do it. Which God is that again? It's the God that's 2.3 light years away. A um, thousand or a million light years away. 13.7 billion light years. That's that same God. Remember back in when they started getting satellites out and they started taking pictures of this uh, blue ball, the blue marble? They talked about the speck of dust in the universe, the mud ball called Earth. By the way, that's what it is. It's just a speck of dust. Not even really hardly enough to be called a speck of dust when you start realizing all the other stuff that's out there. And the scientists now are saying that 90 some odd percent of what we see, actually 90 percent of the matter that's out there cannot be seen. Dark matter, dark energy may actually make up that much of the universe that we are, are actually witnessing out there. God did it. Why is he concerned about this? Questions asked in the prophets too. What is man that you are mindful of him? What is the son of man that you are concerned for him? And then he says he sent his own son to die for you. Did heaven come down? Yes, it did. God himself came down. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1 to the uh, people there that he says, I want to talk to you about this unknown God. Men of, very, of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship and even found an altar inscribed to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. That's what we're doing, isn't it? We're preaching to them a God that they don't know, but we know him. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. I'm going to leave that at that point and let you read that your own some of the time. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the universe. Does that remind you of something? John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that has been made. It's a similar statement, isn't it? Verse 3 to Hebrews 1. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by the word, powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. And then he goes through and quotes scripture showing how that God has made him both Lord and Christ. Do we understand what that means? That Jesus actually was the image of God? It doesn't mean he was a reflection of God. It actually, the word there is much, much stronger than that. It's that he represented God here. He is God here is literally the way we can interpret that. What is God that he would be mindful of man? What is man that God would be mindful of him? We're made in his image. Can we explain it? We can explain it by saying he says it's because he loved us. But when we talk about salvation, we're talking about God coming to us. Why did he do that? Because we could not go to him. Now stop and think about that for a minute. Don't, don't argue with me. Just think about it. God is spirit. Man is flesh. How are we going to get to God made of flesh? Can't do it. God is spirit. He's true, he's wise, he's also faithful, he has never sinned, he cannot sin, can't be tempted by sin. Man, on the other hand, is in the flesh. Man is sinful. Uh, what did we deserve when we sinned that first time? I didn't hear that? Wages of sin is death. We deserve to be paid, didn't we? Someone says, well, all I want from God is justice. Then you're an idiot. You already deserve justice, and he's already got that lined up for you. What you want is mercy. And God has already come down to show us that he will give us that mercy. So we sang a song just a minute ago, Heaven Came Down, and Glory Filled My Soul. That actually is a song talking about the experience of salvation, about God's presence coming to save us, and us as we come to him in faith. And we try to understand that and realize it, and we... we poetically describe it, that heaven came down. But in a very real sense, that's exactly what God did. Heaven came down so that we could be saved because we couldn't do it ourselves.